see everybody out tonight to our reopening Sunday night service. Wow. And, uh, you know, I said this morning, I said this morning when I prayed in there, I got a little bit emotional thinking about it. It's been 903 days since we have met for Sunday night service in the midst of COVID and, and shutdowns and starting back and shutdowns and all that. We never did get rolling on Sunday night, but I tell you what, it feels good to be back. And man, got a nice looking crowd. I'm telling you what. And how many weeks is that big D? 903 days is how many weeks? 129 weeks. I said 50 some weeks today and big D kind of questioned me on that. I was, I was wrong on that. But 129 weeks, 903 days and good to be back tonight. We appreciate everybody that came out. We had our ice cream social for those of you that are watching on Facebook Live. And man, had a great time. Had a revival. Had a, had a what? A, a revi- had a revival. We did have a revival. I forgot about that. We had a revi- had a lizard loose, and uh, it wasn't a Mississippi squirrel revival. It's a lizard, a lizard revival. And now they say it's about that big, it, it running around. So if we, if everybody starts screaming and getting happy tonight, I don't know if it's a lizard or what. But uh, we had one of our quieter members that uh, really, really. Really, uh, took a shouting fit. In fact, I believe she's about to choo choo. <laughs> but I tell you what, what a, that's a good time. But we, we did have a good time and appreciate everybody that came out and worked it with the ice cream. And you know what? I think we ought to do something every month, at least once a Sunday night, every month, and whether it's ice cream, pizzas, or, or whatever. But I think we ought to do something at 5 o'clock every month just for the fellowship. It was great. And, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to do is promote more fellowship, give our folks more opportunities to get out and to do things and get the church back opened up. So we appreciate you being here tonight. We're so glad to have Ted with us tonight. Ted, thank you so much. Wow. Miss Kim got saved last Sunday. And, man, what a blessing that is. And she's out. And Ted's, Ted's down. And, boy, I tell you, Ted, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate that. And we had a great day today at, in, in the morning service. Pastor Steve at FBCC had, had two people saved, two of his Amen. grandsons. What a blessing that was. And then, yeah, absolutely. Shout that out. And then we had Jimmy Kramer got saved over in the children's church this morning. Jimmy's the, Jimmy's the guy that was doing all the answering here today. And uh, if I can share that for just a minute, I'm, and I may get the story wrong, but Jimmy had asked several weeks ago for the plan of salvation, said he wanted to take that home and read that and look at that and be saved. 
And so Miss Carla had given that to him and then got to talking to him today and, and he finalized that up, man. So isn't that exciting? And they stopped and talked to Jimmy's dad. So we got to plan a big baptizing here for him. We got several people need to be baptized and we need to get that on the, on the mark and get that going. But we're so glad for Jimmy. And then John and Pat took membership today. And what a blessing to have them in as official members. And we had to redo the picture. So if you get on Facebook and see it and you, and you say, well, that doesn't look like the morning shot. No, because... The first lady was looking through the pictures, and she's the picture uh, checker. And she said, you weren't smiling at any of them. And so I said, we just have to redo it then tonight. But, uh, wow, we're going to redo it. And then Miss Bella, my buddy Miss Bella, brought me a picture tonight, wrote me a love letter and a picture. And thank you so much, Miss Bella, for doing that. I want you to know how much that means to me. But we're just honored to have you out tonight. And to be here with us as we kick off, it's a good crowd. Man, it's a good crowd out on Sunday night. And uh, so we just, the only thing I've got to say is this. If anybody sees Evelyn yeah. out roaming around, tell her I'm down to two cabbage rolls. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you, when she came to the door yesterday, I believe that tray was about as big as this right here. And she's standing there holding it like this. And I tried, she said, no, 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 it's hot. And it was a big old tray. And packed full of cab. Y'all know what cabbage rolls are up there in Indiana? Okay. All right. I didn't know. Didn't know if you did or not. Just making sure. John, you know what cabbage rolls are? I know what cabbage is. Just a, you just take cabbage and roll across the floor and then pick it up and eat it. It's a cabbage roll. No. It's got meatballs in it and rice and all that stuff. Man, I'm going to tell you what was sauce on I tell you what. They were... Out of this world. What is it? Two more kids that got saved. Two more kids that got saved. And who were the other two besides Jimmy? Who was it? Danielle and Autumn. Danielle and Autumn. So this morning when they talked to them, they prayed and said they asked Jesus in their hearts. So man, what a blessing that is. The children's church is on fire over there. And uh, man, God is doing good things here at Freedom Baptist Church. And we certainly thank God for it. Thank you for being a part of it. So we're going to get started out tonight. We, I'm not going to go through all the prayer lists tonight, but uh, get on our Facebook page and see those, and then all the ones that we mentioned this morning, all those people certainly stand in need of prayer. But I'm going to ask Brother Bill if he'd come up. Bill has been, uh, Bill's one of our elders. He'd been one of the biggest supporters and encouragers of us being back in the church on Sunday night. So I thought it only be fitting for you, Brother Bill, to come up and open us tonight in prayer. And I want you to know we appreciate you and your encouragement. Amen. Father, we do come to you tonight and thank you for the opportunity we have to gather here tonight. It's been so long since we were here on a Wednesday or Sunday night. God, we have a good crowd, and thank you for bringing everybody out. Thank you for our new members, Father, and thank you for the children that were saved. God, we pray your blessing upon them, children. And, Father, we pray for Carla and the workers that work with them. Pray you bless them and encourage them as they keep going. We pray you bring more children in. And, Father, we pray there would be a lighthouse in this community that would stand for the word of God and that uh, we would preach it. We thank you for Pastor and his words. Thank you for Mike Brooks and all he does in leading the music. Father, we're just so grateful for the way you supplied our needs, our financial needs, and just our personal needs. And we pray tonight for those that have a need for you. We think of Bennett Yielding. We pray that you might bless him in a special way and strengthen him. We pray for others on our prayer list. Pray that you would meet their needs as only you can, that you be honored and glorified through it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Don't knock my iPad off. Almost had everybody stand for the pledges just while we get ready to do that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's not a bad thing to stand when we pray. And I'm going to ask you, to, I know it's going to be hard for you after all that ice cream, but I'm going to ask you to stand right now and sing with me. Go ahead, stand. And we're going to sing, He Set Me Free. You can't hardly sing this song sitting down. That's it. That, he got you going already. Must be a lizard over there. But anyway, it's just good, good to be in God's house tonight. He set me free. Here we go. That's it. Oh, aren't you glad to be set free in the Lord tonight? Once like a bird in prison I dwelt No freedom from my sorrow I felt 
But Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. Yes, he set me free, yes, he set me free, and he broke the bonds of prison for me. And glory bound my Jesus to see, for glory to God, he set me free. planted on higher ground. Glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He set me free, yes, He set me free, and He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see for glory to God. Oh, I love this next verse. Goodbye to sin and things that confound. Not of this world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to, and glory to God, I'm going through. He set me free, yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Tell you, why don't you go ahead and do this and just take a moment to say hello to those around you. God bless you. you, are, you Ed, he's got the spirit already tonight, ain't he? Yeah. Go ahead and say hello to one another as Pastor comes. <coughs> All your deal. <coughs> you all right? What'd you, what'd you get? I got all the signs. <laughs> got ticklish. All right. All right, you can be seated. I'm telling you, I, I, I preached a week or two ago on Wednesday night on how to behave thyself in the house of God. I may have to go back and preach on that again here. We don't know how to, we don't know how to behave on Sunday nights, do we? But uh, man, thank you, Pastor Brooks. I love that song, and man, what a blessing, what a blessing that is. And again, so good to have you out tonight to be with us here in our opening up of our Wednesday night service. Well, you know, it's been 129 weeks. What did I say? What did I say? No. I can't think. What's up? Guys, we got visitors here. So don't, don't. I said Wednesday night. The beauty of being live, isn't it? You can't do anything about it. Well, I don't even know what I said. It, anyhow, on how to behave thyself on Sunday night. I don't know where I'm at. Then it's been 129 weeks that uh, we have not had service in the building, but we have been, you know, I thank God for technology. We've been able to carry on even in the midst of COVID and shutdowns and, and all the things that we battled for these last basically two and a half years, it looks like. And I can't tell you how many lessons I've taught. Now, my buddy Glenn Hager can probably tell us, but he probably can't tell me tonight. How many lessons I've taught on end time events? I'm a little bit loud. I'm hurting my own self. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, better, better, better. But anyhow, many of those went a Sunday night. Almost said it again, didn't I? Many of those Sunday nights have been on end time events. In fact, it's gone on so long that Pastor Brooks dubbed it endless. the endless end time events. But it's been a lot. But, you know, I spent a majority of those Sunday nights talking about, and I wanted to say to Miss Kim tonight that good thing you weren't here this morning. We had people that had to take their hearing aids out of their ears this morning. <laughs> not to call any names out, <laughs> not to put anybody on the spot, but I don't know what happened if somebody got too loud or what. But, uh, you know, I, I told Miss Kim that I'm going to try, maybe I won't. I, just, I don't know what will happen tonight. I really don't. But uh, I don't know if I'll be in a teaching mode or preaching mode or a treaching mode. I don't know. Maybe a mixture of both. I don't know. But anyhow, I spent a lot of those Sunday nights on this subject. If you remember this, 
spiritual deception. Spiritual deception. And when you think about end time events, people always wonder, how can you tell, how do you know that we're living down what the Bible talks about, really, or do you think we're living down close to the time of the rapture of the church? I absolutely do. I don't know when. It may be another hundred years, maybe a thousand years. I don't know. But according to what the Bible says and the events and the things that we're seeing happen, and they're happening, they're happening at an alarming rate. It's not like something's happening and then you're going years and you see something happening and then going years and you see something. In the last three years, we have seen an accelerated rate of things that nothing that has to happen but end time events, things that have been going on over these past three years at an accelerated rate. And when you think about that, <clears throat> you think about that, one of the signs that we've seen in the last, specifically in the last three years, would be spiritual deception. I, I mean, face it, people are spiritually deceived. One of the problems in America tonight is that people are spiritually deceived. And not only is, is America spiritually deceived, the world is spiritually deceived. And you know, again, I can almost give them a pass and can say, okay, I understand that. But the churches are spiritually deceived. And Christians are spiritually deceived. And the Bible said, I wanted to get on this tonight, but I don't think I'll get there tonight. But one of the things the Bible talks about is a great falling away before, before the rapture of the church. Paul told them in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, said, listen, you know, there's going to be a great falling away. They thought they had missed it. They thought they were in the great tribulation. And Paul said, no, this is, two things have to happen before the tribulation. Number one is the great falling away, the apostasy, that people are departing from the, the teachings of the Bible. You have to be very smart to figure that out. It, and now, if your head's been in the, in the sand and you don't have any spiritual discernment, then you may not know what I'm talking about. But if you've got any spiritual discernment, you realize that, man, we're seeing a great fall. Uh, you say, what are they falling away from? The faith. Jude said in the book of Jude, verse number three, the only chapter, chapter one, verse number three, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We have the body of faith right here in this Bible. We have the book of faith right here in this Bible, what we need. And what we're seeing today is this falling away, this departure. No longer is this the, the standard. No longer is this the final authority. No longer does the people say, well, what does the Bible say? What does God say? Now it's, well, so-and-so said. You know, I kind of hammered a little bit on that this morning. I don't care what Pastor Brooks says or what I say or the major what he says if it's not in the Bible. Well, you say, that's my opinion. Listen, your opinion is like everybody else's opinion. When you're going to preach and teach the Word of God, you need to preach and teach what thus saith the Lord. And, you know, if you preach and teach what thus saith the Lord, I don't think you can preach too hard. I don't think, you know, I, I, Brother Bill and I talked about this the other day. If you preach on, listen, if you rip and tear into sin, that's what, that's what preaching ought to do. It ought to rip and tear into sin. It ought to take the hide off of you. It ought to rough you up. It ought to be just like taking sandpaper and scuffing you down and letting you know, listen, because you need to live better than that. But we're seeing a departure from that. We're seeing a falling away from that. And so I understand when the world, I understand when America's falling away, but it's hard for me to understand that Christians and churches are falling away. I'm talking about not just, I'm not talking about drifting away. I'm not talking about coasting away. I'm talking about running away from the main body of faith, and that's the Word of God, amen? So, you know, I, I used in Matthew 24 for weeks and weeks and weeks when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came unto him, and, you know, they began to ask him, said, when shall these things be, and, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And in, in verse number four, Jesus answered and said unto them, the first thing he said unto them, Take heed that no man, what? Deceive. Deceive you. Wow. And that's where I started a lot of the end times studies. And, and I went for 20, 20 some weeks on spiritual deception. And, you know, I, I hit about everything you could hit. And, in fact, if you've not listened to those, I would encourage you to go back and listen to those. 
I really wish I had the ability to put that in book form, to be honest with you. Because those are the things that we're seeing happen today. And when you think about that, I talked about it. Let me just give you, can I give you a quick rundown of what I talked about? I spent weeks talking about people being deceived about the Savior. All these start with S and make, make a sermon. It would be a heck of a sermon, wouldn't it? That's why it took me 20-some weeks to get through it. People deceived about the Savior. People are deceived about salvation. People are deceived about the Scriptures. People are deceived about sermons. What is, what is a sermon, you know? People are deceived about these church service. What, what is a church service? People are deceived about the songs that they sing in church today. I mentioned this morning, Major, you didn't hear that. You heard it on the replay that there was a time in America when Baptist preachers were locked up for having singing in the church. Church was a time when this here, this, this here was preeminent. This here was the, was the primary thing, was the preaching of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And, uh, you know, when you think about that, we've, we've, we're a long way from that. So people are confused about the songs. People are deceived about Satan. They really don't know anything biblically about Satan. Everybody says, oh, yeah, I believe in, in the devil. And he's running around with the big ears and a red tail and a pitchfork. But that's not what Satan looks like. He's probably, the most, when you see him, if you're, you're, if you're a woman and you see him, he'd probably look like the most handsome man you've ever seen. If you're a man and you see him, he'd probably look like the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. Because that's the way Satan comes to you. And then people are deceived about sin. Wow. <laughs> Whew. Wow, the spiritual deception about sin today with you know, all, the, all the alphabet people and all the things that, 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 that the Word of God just flat out condemns as now being condoned in churches and among Christian people. Then I, I talked about people deceived about sinners. They don't understand sinners and where they stand. The Bible says if, you're, you know, if you've never been saved, you're lost now. People say, I'm waiting to be lost. Maybe I hope I'm not. Well, you're lost today. They don't understand where sinners are. They're deceived about that. And then they're deceived about saints. They don't understand about the church, the, the Christians. They think that we're perfect. We're not perfect. I wish that we were perfect. One day we will be perfect. I said one time, you know, I, and I can't, well, I'm trying to think, it just came to my mind. I was in revival somewhere and I preached on, you can sin as much as you want to. And somebody took offense to that. I said, but I don't, if you're a Christian, you really don't want, you don't want to sin at all. It's, it's, you got to get you want to saved, amen? So I uh, preached on, you know, people deceived about saints. And then, boy, I, I think I finished up with this one. This was, might have been the hottest topic of all. People are deceived about sex. And, uh, man, I just, you know, I just tore into all those things. And tonight I want to talk to you about another end-time tactic that Satan uses. And he uses it very well. And you see it on the screen up there, Distractions. Not only are we living in a time of spiritual deception, we're living in a time of spiritual distractions. Satan is not only, listen, in our song it talks about he's the master of deception. Satan is the master of deception. Man, he, he, in fact, I tell people, if you think you can't be deceived by Satan, you probably already are deceived about Satan. Here's the only defense you have to keep you from being deceived about Satan. This is the only thing you can hold in your hand and it can guarantee you not to be deceived about Satan and let Satan deceive you. But because we are so spiritually illiterate today and we do not know what the Bible says, we've opened up the church and the floodgates and we've brought every, we've brought every kind of thing in. We've brought every kind of music in. We've brought every kind of preaching in. We've brought every kind of program in. we brought every kind of Eastern mysticism in. we brought in New Age philosophies in. we brought in all this stuff that absolutely, as I said this morning, a hundred years, somebody come back from the dead, they would not even know they're in a church. But Satan is not only the master of deception, he's also the master of distraction. I want to use, I'm going to be using a couple of verses and I'm going to jot these down just as, I'm going to be bouncing everywhere to get started. And again, I don't have to finish up. That's the great thing about Sunday nights. You don't really have, on Sunday morning, you kind of have to come to a point where you got to land the plane. And you probably can tell I have a problem landing the plane. You know, I can, you know, I can get up in the air. But, you know, a part, of, a part of flying is, you know, you, you don't get on, well, I'm sorry, we cannot land. You're going to have to fly forever. You know, who wants to hear that when they're up in the air? 
And sometimes my problem in preaching, and especially on Sunday mornings, because you're always fighting the clock. I don't care who you are, you're always running against that clock on Sunday morning. They've got to land the plane. And sometimes you can't find a runway to land. And you just have to just crash it. And uh, that's probably what happens in many of my sermons, they just crash. But tonight I want to use for a, a kind of a launching pad a couple verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And I want you to look at these, listen to these verses in that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And boy, I want to say we got a good crowd on tonight for the, for the uh, Facebook Live. We, we changed. You know, we've been on at 8 o'clock for how many weeks did I say? 59 weeks. No, not 59 weeks, 129 weeks. And, uh, you know, and people say they miss the face-to-face, that close-up in the camera. So don't forget, we're going to be doing that Tuesday morning. We're having Bible study here Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. You're welcome to come. It's for men and women, and we'll be having it, we may be having it right out there in the kitchen where we can just sit around the table. And I hope to set the, the phone up and just give a face-to-face, you know, instead of the this. I don't have close Todd's got me, but zoom in on me, Todd. Up, let them see this big, ugly snout and face right up here, if you would. Make them feel better. The, the people want to see my face up close and personal, I guess. But, you know, we'll be doing that Tuesday morning. But listen to what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice in verse 1 what the writer said. Let us lay aside every weight. You know there's some things that you carry in your Christian life that they may not be sin. He said we need need to get rid of the sin which does so easily beset us. And sin will easily beset you. It will trip you up and trick you up and cause you to have all kind of trouble. But he also said to lay aside the weights. Every weight. You know, if you were a runner, and you can tell by looking at my body, I'm not a runner. I get Carl up here and let her stand beside him, and then we see what a runner looks like. But I'm not a runner. I try to run some, but not much. Obviously, you can tell by looking at my fat face. But, uh, you know, when you go to run in a race, they strip down. They don't carry baggage. They don't carry a backpack with stuff on their back. They don't. They don't do that because those things hinder them and weigh them down. And I tell you what I found out in 40 some years in the ministry that there are a lot of things that you just can't catch a hold of and carry with you in your Christian life. And they may not be sinful, but they could be weights that keep you from being all that you ought to be for the Lord. And, you know, listen. Distractions are just another tool that Satan uses to keep people from being saved. I mean, he'll he'll give you every distraction, every excuse why you can't be saved, why you can't do it, why you can't live it, you've done this, you've done that. And then after you get saved, then he begins to give you excuses and distractions to keep you from being what God wants you to be. And, you you know, God wants you to be spiritually effective. That's our, you know, our main mission here is to see people saved. Amen. We're not, listen, I, listen, if we wanted to build a crowd, we could build a crowd. We could have this place filled up next Sunday. Bingo, social drinking out here at 10 o'clock, a little bit of stuff going on in the back room, put that on a big sign out there and they'd be knocking the doors down to get in. But about the time I got up and said, now I'm going to preach to you now from the Word of God. They said, oh, I'm sorry, I got to go. Because, you know, the devil uses distractions to keep people from being what they ought to be. I'm going to give you two examples of people in the Bible tonight. And we may come back to both of these. But I want to give you two examples of people in the Bible tonight that give us how to handle distractions and how not to handle distractions. Number one, Pastor Brooks helped me with with this. He sent me his notes on distractions, and that's always a blessing anytime I can get something from somebody else. But 
the guy in the Old Testament is Nehemiah. There's a whole book devoted to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. You know, they'd been carried away out of, out, of, out of Jerusalem and Israel and down into Babylonian captivity. And after 70 years, God let them go back. Well, when the Babylonians destroyed, you know, you know when they came in, the Romans destroyed uh, the, the, the city and the Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They tore the walls down. They tore the temple down. They just tore everything down. Well, they came back and they were living without any walls. Walls were a protection back then. And they have any protection. And God laid upon Nehemiah's heart to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he went back and built it in a, like a record amount of time. If you go back and read, man, there's so many great spiritual lessons. I love teaching out of the book of Nehemiah. Obviously, you do too. But Nehemiah went back to begin to build the walls of Jerusalem. Do you think he built them without opposition? No. no. Do you think he built them without obstacles? No. Do you think he built them without distractions? No. Satan threw every kind of distraction at him that you could imagine. And you know what? One of the, one of the times Nehemiah finally said, oh no, I'm not coming down. They said, we want you to come and meet with us in the plain of Ono. And, and, and Nehemiah said, oh no, I'm not coming off the wall. I'm staying on the wall. And he did not let anything distract him. He did, not, he did not take his eyes off the goal. He did not take his eyes away from what God called him to do. And he accomplished his goal and the walls were built. Amen. Example of how not to be distracted. Then we come to the New Testament. And we got a guy in the New Testament by the name of Peter. And oh, Peter was, uh, Peter was a lot like, I want to say a lot like us, but I shouldn't say that. Probably Peter was a lot like me. He spoke a lot of times when he should have been listening. And he was quick to speak instead of quick for a lot of other things. And it got him in trouble. And remember the boys were out, again, here's another story of the storm. And the boys out on the ship at night in the storm, professional fishermen. And the storm got so bad, man, they thought, they, they thought this is it. And Jesus up on the mountain watching them. Isn't it great to know, because even though when you can't see Jesus, Amen. Jesus sees you. Amen. And really, listen, listen, it'd be great if we, could get a, if we could see Jesus, but we don't have to see Jesus. We just have to know that He's there because Jesus sees us. Amen. And Jesus is up there praying while they're out there in the storm and they're toiling and they're rowing and, and they're about to drown and they're about to go under and think, this is it. And Jesus is just up there watching them. And the Bible said it wasn't the fourth watch of the night. Way down near morning, all night. I don't, know, I don't know why Jesus lets us toil sometimes. I don't know why he lets us struggle sometimes. I think it's to develop our character and develop our trust in him. They had rowed, they had toiled, they had worked all night, and they couldn't do anything in the storm. And about the darkest part of the night... They look out. Well, I'm about to get happy. Amen. Hold your ears. I'm about to get happy. Amen. And they look out. And they see somebody walking on the water. Amen. And they thought it was the ghost or a spirit. And they cried out. <laughs> and Jesus said, have no fear, guys. It's me. Amen. And Peter, we always beat Peter up. But Peter said, Lord... If it's really you, let me walk on the water. Amen. And you know what Jesus said? Come on out. Why well, I'm getting happy. Amen. To think that everybody else stayed in the boat. Peter's the only guy that got out of the boat. He's the only one that had enough. He's the only person other than Jesus Christ that was able to walk on water. Amen. And he stepped out. I don't know if he jumped out. I don't know if he tippy toed out like getting into a cold pool. I don't know if he tested it out. I don't know what he did. But Jesus said, come on. And the Bible said he just come out of there. And you know what he did? He walked on water. And you know what he was doing while he was walking on water, John? He had his eyes right on Jesus. And every step he took, he kept those eyes right on Jesus. And you know what? As long as he kept his eyes right on Jesus, he didn't have any trouble. 
But there was a storm out there. By the way, storms can be a distraction. There was a storm out there. There were waves out there. Waves in your life could be a distraction. There were waves billowing up about to take that boat under. And I tell you, those things can be a distraction. And Peter, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, did what nobody else had ever done. And then all of a sudden, I don't know why, I don't know how. <laughs> you know, why is it when you got a good thing going, you can run it? <laughs> he had a great thing going, he's walking on water. I don't know if he turned, I don't guess he turned around, he just sunk. He might have hollered and said, hey boys, hey boys, I'm walking on water. Nobody else got out. I don't know if he's shouting, choo choo, and I don't know if he's like Miss Gwen a while ago, had both hands up going across there going, whoa, man, I'm walking on the water. But I know as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he didn't have a bit of trouble. But there came a point when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to look at the storm. And he began to look at the, the wind, hear the, what the wind was doing in the waves. You know what the Bible said happened to Peter at that very moment? He began to sink. I'm going to say this to you tonight, and it's going to be offensive to you, so just hold on. As soon as you take your eyes off Jesus, you begin to sink. Amen. Has anybody ever known anybody's backslid in their Christian life? You didn't backslide six months down the road. You probably backslid right here. Sitting right here. And you quit doing what God wanted you to do. And you got your eyes off of Jesus. And you begin to think about everything else out yonder. And the next thing you knew, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible reading, prayer, living a godly life, none of those things were important to you. Because you begin to go, I don't know if you know this or not. We live close to water, right? When you begin to sink, you go down. When you begin to sink spiritually, you go down. You ain't nobody ever going up spiritually by taking their eyes off Jesus. So we've got two main examples that we can just talk about all night. One out of the Old Testament, how to handle distractions. And then, you know, sometimes it's good to have somebody to tell you how to not handle distractions. So those are two good examples that I wanted to give you tonight. But I can guarantee, I can take it to the bank. Put it in the bank. It's better than gold. When you take your eyes off Jesus, I don't care what it is. And listen, this is what I want you to understand tonight. Satan doesn't care what it is. Amen. It may be the preacher. It, it, it might, might be the singing. I don't know how anybody could be upset with your singing, Miss Jean, Pastor Brooke. But you know, you know, I'm sure there are people out there probably say, well, I don't like that. It might be somebody in church. Somebody, well, they didn't speak to me. Or I didn't get my way. Or they didn't do this. And it, it could be, it, listen, it doesn't matter. Satan is no respecter of persons. He didn't care if it's your family. He didn't care if it's your husband. He didn't care if it's your wife. He didn't care if it's your children. He didn't care if it's your neighbor. He didn't care who you work for. He does not care who or what it is as long as he can get your eyes off of Jesus. Because see, Jesus, Satan knows something that many Christians don't know. You sink when you get your eyes off of Jesus. You begin to go down in your spiritual life. So again, one of Satan's greatest deceptions, that's one of my harp on tonight, is that he wants to hinder you in your walk with Jesus Amen. through distractions. I know, that dis I know that distractions are real, and Satan used them to keep us from being effective Christians. Do you know that? What you got to do, you got to learn to recognize them. You got to learn to deal with them. Are you always going to get your way? No. Somebody ever going to rub you wrong? Things going to go bad in your life? You're going to have storms. All those things are going to happen, but you know what? You got to learn how to recognize them and deal with them. And I'm going to make an analogy here. And I, and I, I don't know if I can get this across or not. I was in the school system for several years. Miss Bella can attest to that back there. My grandkids can attest to that. And there's something in school today that many kids have. 
They had it more so today than what they had back years ago for some reason. I don't, I'm not smart enough to figure that out. What's called ADD or ADHD. Now, if you, if you haven't been around education and you don't, you don't know what those terms mean, let me describe what those mean. ADD is Attention Deficit Disorder. That means you have problem focusing, paying attention. ADHD is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Not only can you not pay attention, you can't stay in your seat. And I know, listen, I was, I was in administration. And parents would come in and you just say, do you think, have you had your kid checked? And they'd be, oh, no. Have you considered meds? No. I'm against them. And I'd always say, come and spend a day with me. <laughs> and you'll be dispensing them if you could. You'd be giving them out. You'd be writing prescriptions for them. Not just tell that, but I'd like to tell that. Because honestly, whether you believe it or not, you don't have to believe this. You can have your own opinion. You can disagree. This is not Bible. This is just an analogy. So you can disagree with this. But I absolutely know kids that without that daily dose of that meds, they cannot be effective in their educational studies. And I always wanted to tell parents, you're not doing your child justice you're not helping your child by being in denial and not getting them something that can fix them and help them learn. Now you say, I don't agree with it. Well, that's, you don't have to agree with that. But this is what happened to the, to the child of the ADD mind. Their mind is going like this. It is spinning so fast that everything, everything is a distraction. Everything bothers them. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Somebody can tap a pencil. Somebody can go to the pencil sharpener. Somebody can blow their nose. Somebody can uh, cough. And everything, their mind is going so fast that they just absolutely can't focus on learning. And then when you get the other part, that HD part onto it, well, they're doing that not in their seats, then you really got your hands full. Am I right, Miss Glenn? Or Miss Glenn back? Miss Glenn knows what I'm talking about. So you take them and they get diagnosed and they get treated to a doctor and they're all kind of different meds that they try them. I tried meds and it didn't work. Well, they got more meds than one. Keep trying them till you find something because your kid needs to learn. You say, how do you know all that? Guess who else battles? ADD. I don't know if you can tell that or not. I probably got the ADHD. Heart. And you say, I don't believe that. Well, ask my wife when she's trying to tell me something. And I am so unfocused. And I've got 110 things going through my mind at the same time. And she said, did you hear me? And I said, oh, yeah. She said, what did I say? I said, I don't have a clue. Oh. What, what did I just say? I just told you that. I said, I know I heard you, but I don't know what it was. Because I'm going to tell you, it's a real, it, it, listen, back when I was a kid, Daddy took care of it. Yep, amen. They used to, let me make it better. They just called, well, I could say I'm, I'm, I'm just a daydreamer. Yeah. I can remember Miss Glenn, I don't know if you can even imagine this. They used to tell Daddy, he said, he just goes to the pencil sharpener and gets up out of his seat and goes to the pencil and just stands and just stares out the window. <laughs> it will keep you from being effective in your schooling. I have to really, and that's why sometimes I keep asking, if I ask you over and over and it bothers you, because my ADD is kicked in and I'm, I, I, I'm hearing you, but I've got a, a 110,000 things going through my mind that it just ain't registering. You say, how in the world can you pastor and preach and do all that you do? I don't know how. Miracles happen. Amen. Miracles happen. I don't know how you do it. There's times you have to just read, you read the same thing over and over and over and over and over, and your mind's going, to, and you're trying to read, and you're thinking about everything for the next six months down the road. Because you just can't get your mind to slow down. And that's what, Big D, that's what the meds do for kids that really struggle. Some kids just probably need a good, a good tuning up, maybe. 
I ain't going to lie about it. Then there's some kids that really have the problem. I mean, they're like hanging off the light fixtures. I mean, you go and you see them, they're just, I mean, you think they're monkeys in, in, on a cage. And ain't nobody can do anything with them. And you're begging the parents, please take them to the doctor. I'm against that. Well, let me pull that back in a minute, can I? I think the same thing, I think we've got spiritual ADD. You see, Satan bombards us with so much information and so many things that are coming at you and so many things that are just vying for your, for your attention and for your focus. And, and one of the things that Satan does to us with our spiritual ADD, ADHD, is that we, didn't, we can't process what's going on. So we're in a fix and a panic and we're in a, we're in a distracted mode because we're, we're not getting anything. We, I, I hear you preacher, but it's not getting through. And the reason it's not getting through is because Satan has got, and I'm going to say this now, I hope this doesn't offend you. Notice in the last three years what has happened out of our government, out of our big house up there. All the information, the misinformation, the mis misinformation. It's every day during COVID. Did you get so sick of COVID? Yes. Did you get so sick of every day? Well, today you don't need to do this. And the next day you got to do this. And the next day you got to do this. And the next day you don't need a mask. And the next day you need two masks. And the next day you need, not only need a shot, you need a booster shot. And then you only need a booster shot and a shot. You need a booster for the booster shot. And the next day they, then they start walking back. Say, well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe those masks didn't have. Maybe you didn't really need those booster shots. And you know what it's doing to us? You know what's happened to the church? You know what's happened? We've lost our focus. We've let all that information come in at us. And, just, I mean, it's, and, and we talked about that not long ago. And the government knows exactly what they're doing. Yes. Because you can't focus on one of those items quick enough until they change their opinion on it to the next day. And you, somebody says, hey, did you hear about that? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah you, now you've got to have three masks on there. You said, really? No, they just changed the day that you don't even have to have a mask. What? And it keeps us so discombobulated, or what's that word? You know what I'm talking about? Messed up that we don't know what's going on. And it keeps us in such a state of uproar in our mind. Why do you think? I'm sorry to keep getting on education. Why do you think came on the TV the other day and said that the math scores and the reading scores went down? You know why they went down? Because kids were not in school. And the liberals did not want them in school. They would have kept them out. They'd have still been out if they'd had their way. Teachers would have never gone back. The liberal, te can I say that? The liberal teachers unions, they want to go back. They want to go back. Well, now we've got a problem. I knew we had a problem when it started. <laughs> I knew our kids would take 20 years to overcome if we, if we can ever overcome the learning that they missed during COVID. But we're not much better. Because while all this stuff is being poured into us on a daily basis, can I just say, the news can be a distraction. You don't take a shout and fit right there. I turn the news on. We, you know, we've been on this, break, this retirement tour. I ain't watched much news. And boy, the first lady had been a happy lady. Amen. And we got home on the night. She said, I'm going to tell you something. We're not going to watch that news all the time. I said, we ain't. I said, I just want to see it for a minute. I mean, you know, it's like a fix. You know, I got to have it. Let me just see it for a minute. She said, we ain't going to watch that news like that. But I'm going to tell you what the news will do. I'll tell you what the news will do. It'll distract you. It will, it will cause you to forget that this Bible is the true Word of God. And it will cause you to not realize that things are not falling apart. They're falling into place. 
And it'll cause you to be so upset and confused that, you know, why do you think kids are going out here at an alarming rate committing suicide? Yes. They're confused. Yes. Big D, when you and I grew up, we weren't confused. No. <laughs> Aren't you glad? I'm all man. <laughs> and I'm glad my wife's all woman. Yes. I'm glad I don't have to ask, honey, are you a man? <laughs> well, if I had to ask that, we'd never been married in the first place. You got all this information coming to these kids. Well, you know, you might not be a male. You might not be a female. You might not know what you are. You might be one of 52 different things. Here's your list. Pick out what you want to be. And we wonder, we wonder why kids are confused because they're so distracted with all this false information that's coming to them that they don't know if their head's up or down. Right. You say, they don't know if I don't, I don't, they ought to be able to know if they're male or female, but I don't know if they know if their head's up or down. I don't know if they could tell you what color red and blue is. I don't know if they can tell you. I'd get them in my office and say, what's your name? I don't know. <laughs> what's your last name? I don't know. What's your mommy's name? I don't know. Where do you live? I don't know. Those are probably all valid questions. I wish I could have snuck around and asked him, are you a boy or a girl? I bet you every time I'd have gotten the right answer. I bet you every time. I bet you every time if, if you'd ask some of those little old elementary school and some of these middle school and these big old high school boys, are you a boy or a girl? Unless they didn't know, they'd probably say I'm a I'm a boy, or I'm a little girl. But they're distracted with all this stuff yes. being poured on top of them. Right. And then we wonder why we're in a mess. We wonder why that. Man, listen, I, I just got to tell you, man, we're, 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 in, we're in trouble on so many areas yep. that the normal person, let me say, that's not a good word, the average person doesn't even have a clue what's going on. Because this has been pushed either out or to the back. And we no longer care what God says because we're getting all this information. Brother Bill, can you imagine, Bill or Bill, when you boys were boys... And somebody come and said, I think you, maybe, you're, maybe you don't know what you are. I can imagine these two guys, they probably wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been one one to tell them that. <laughs> Listen, but, I, but I, I, I want to say to you, man, you say, well, what, <laughs> what's the answer? Well, listen, let me tell you what the answer is. The answer is, and I, and I got to quit. The answer is that we need our daily dose Amen. of the Word of God. Yeah. If you don't get you some of this on a daily basis, if you don't get your meds, I used to call them at school, have you had your vitamins? <laughs> no. I didn't have to ask. I knew. I said, hey, they'd be climbing over everything. I said, hey, have you had your vitamin today? They said, no. And I said, I knew it. I knew it. Well, it's the same way with Christian folk. You see him struggle. You see him flounder. You see him beginning to sink. You see him letting the cares of the world and, and the misinformation and all the information that's being poured into him. And they're so confused and they're so distracted that they're forgetting about this right here. And the next thing you know, they've got trouble in their spiritual life. Yes. Right. I want to say to you today, I don't know if you know it or not, but I'm here to tell you. I stopped by to tell you that you need a daily Amen. dose of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I had a guy back home one time. He was a drug addict. I could imitate him and sound just like him, but I won't because somebody on the camera might know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but I could mock him pretty good. And he was a real honest to goodness fledging. He's dead now. <clears throat> Killed him. I said, do you read the Bible? No. 
No. Are you praying? No. I knew he wouldn't come to church. I didn't have to ask that. I could see that with my own eyes. No. No, I don't like to read. No, I don't like to do that. Oh, but you like all this other stuff. There is a med that you can take Amen. that will help you with spiritual distraction. Amen. And it's called the W-O-R-D, Word of God. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something tonight that maybe you haven't heard, maybe I haven't said it, maybe Pastor Brooks, or maybe we haven't said it. You need every day, you need to find you at least a verse or two and read you something in that Bible. Amen. You say, I can't read. We'll get on, you know, I can send you a podcast. Amen. Can I just turn my back to the crowd for a minute, Pastor Brooks, until I get so frustrated with church members mm-hmm. that we did 500 and some programs on Facebook Live and you can't get some of them on there. Mm-hmm. We didn't do that for us, guys. We didn't do that for us. We did it for... I don't do those podcasts for me, although they're a blessing to me. They're helping me. I do that so that my people, that me as the shepherd of the flock, the little shepherd under the big shepherd, can keep shoveling out, shoveling out, shoveling out some way to help you. All you got to do, all you got to do is click a button. I don't like it. I don't like to read. Well, what do you like? You like to struggle? You like to toil? You like to just, 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 just be ineffective for Jesus? Because that's what we've got in America tonight. Is we've got churches full of people that are ineffective. They have no spiritual power that's got spiritual ADD. And they don't even know... Yes, I don't know if they've even been saved or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. But yet they want to. I'm trying not to be mean. But yet they want to tell me how to do it. God bless you. Got your hands full on that one. <laughs> Got your hands full on that one. I can't wait to go fishing this fall with Big D. And I think when we go fishing, I'm going to tell him, I say, you're doing it all wrong, buddy. (laughs) You don't know what you're doing. Let me tell you how to do it. This guy's like the professional crappie fisherman of the world. I got a feeling if I told him that, he'd take take my rear end back to the dock and say, out. (laughs) Out. Go on back to the house. I don't need that. Well, we can't do that. And we don't want to do that here. We want to love you. Yes. We want to help you. We want to encourage you. We want to strengthen you. We want to, we want to give you every tool possible. Why do you think we're having Tuesday morning Bible study? Well, the pastor's decided he's going to do all these programs now that he's, now that he's not an educator. You think that's what it is? Do you really think that's what it is? I can tell you what, it's a whole lot more fun to stay at the house and get in that chair and just relax. Man, I've had a big week, a busy week of ministry work last week. I've been at it since 5.15 this morning. It's now 6.56. I'm tired. I wish I'd have had a nap. I wish I'd have had a better dinner later. We had to eat early. I wish I hadn't gotten ice cream on my shirt. If I'd have had all those things, maybe I'd have been in a little bit better mood tonight. But I want you to know something now. We're here to help you. Amen. And I'm going to say this. Now going back on Sunday night's not for me. Amen. I got pretty used to preaching in shorts and sitting in my chair. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you something. When it first started, buddy, it was an uncomfortable. You felt like a big long-tailed tomcat in a room full of rocking chairs. Yeah. After 500 and some programs of doing that, I thought, man, this ain't bad. <laughs> this is pretty nice. I'd take a nap. I could even teach school and come home and be in the ministry and come and take a nap and still do it at 8 o'clock. So don't you think that what we're doing 
is for us. It's for us. And let me say to you tonight, thank you for being here. And thank you for showing up. Man, what an encouragement. Pastor Brooks says, we're talking about the the great turnout. I said, yes, about two or three times more than what I figured. (laughs) I think we need to have ice cream more often. (laughs) But I'm going to be talking over the next several weeks about distractions. I'm just kind of laying the foundation tonight. But I want you to know, I want you to know something. Wow. Man, it's a joy. It's a joy to know Jesus. It's the great, hey, Pastor Brooks, it's the greatest work I've ever been involved in in my life is to be able to serve Jesus Christ and to be able to serve you as my brothers and sisters. It's not something that we take for granted or take lightly. But I want you to get on board with me and follow the leader and go with God and have yourself a time. You know, Brother Clarence talking about getting up early and going out and walking, sitting on the porch. I love that. I'm still on my. I'm still on that. I'm still on that work schedule. I'm staying up later and I'm still getting up the same time. I mean, I'm still waking up and I get, get, oh, I said, oh, no, I looked at the clock and I said, oh, no. I just get up because I love it. And I go in, I start on my podcast, I start on my Bible reading, I start working on sermons, I start working on lessons. And man, by the time the day gets started, I've already got most of the day in. So if you see me out playing, I'm playing because I've already been up. While you're in the bed, I've got my work already halfway done. Man, I got to tell you, it's exciting. You listen to people say, I don't enjoy being a Christian. Well, they ain't, probably really ain't one. And I'm not really growing. Well, there's probably a reason why. And I don't understand everything that's going on. It's because you're not getting your daily dose of the Word of God. I like to challenge you, but I don't really want to because I know how my challenges go. They generally don't go very well. And then I get mad and upset and aggravated and frustrated and hurt and disappointed. And I don't want you to, I don't want this to be a, I don't want this to be a, a, a verbal commitment. I don't want you to come up to me and say, hey pastor, I made a commitment tonight to do this. No, no. I don't want you to come to me in a week or two weeks and hey, I did what you said. No, no. But I do want to challenge you Sometime in the morning. You say, I'm not a morning person, then do it at night. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, I don't like to stay up, but we'll do it in the middle of the day. Right. But I'm going to challenge you somewhere. Get alone with God. Yeah. Get your Bible. And if it's just one verse, just, I don't even know where to start. Ask me, I'll help you. Yes. My wife puts on probably two devotions a day on Facebook. Good devotions. We're flooding Facebook with information. Only because we want to try to help you be what God wants you to be. It's our job. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to close with this. We don't do it for money. We don't do it for name. We don't do it for fame. We don't do it for game. We do it because that's what God has called us to do. So if you want to learn how to handle distractions and learn more about end time distractions, come out on Wednesday night and be with us. May God bless you. Pastor Brooks, come to sing a song. Maybe you're here tonight. Maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and say, man, I don't even know. I don't even understand what I was going on. Listen, all you got to do is understand I'm lost as a goose and on my way to hell. If you can understand that, you're way ahead of the game, buddy. And then you can pray a prayer something like this. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. That's not very hard to figure out. I know I cannot save myself. If you could save yourself, Jesus would not have come. 
And today, tonight, I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart and save me. And if you meant that, you say, how do I know it'll work? Because you meant it. And because there'll be some things that'll change in your life. You'll begin to want to do what God says. You'll begin to want to follow the Bible. You'll begin to be obedient to what God says. This altar's open. If you want to come and pray, come tonight. If you prayed that prayer, let me know. May God bless you, Pastor Brooks. You've been distracted. This is a really good place to get on focus. Right here on either side of me where these altars are. Go ahead and start this song. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I don't know about you. I love being set free in Christ. And let those chains fall. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Turn it up. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Sing it out. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has rescued me. And like the flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing. Shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. But God, who called me here below, will be forever mine. Will be. Forever mine, Lord, you are forever.
Well, I'll tell you what, uh, don't forget, Wednesday night, we're going to be in here again Amen. at 7 o'clock. We look forward to that. No ice cream before that. No, but uh, Tuesday, morning, Tuesday morning, truth, truths. I can't say the word very well, but the funny thing happened this morning. We were talking, Pastor was telling me what the title of our Bible study would be, and he kept saying, and he said it right. I was understanding it wrong. He kept saying, Tuesday morning, truths. And I thought he was saying truce. And I thought afterwards, after the sermon this morning, I thought, man, that'd been a great, you know, outline title for his sermon this morning because we make so many truces when it comes to dealing with the Word of God. We're like, you know, but no, Tuesday morning truths. I'll have to get my Arkansas voice out of the way for that. But uh, look forward to that. So be here before 10. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. God bless you tonight. Major, close us out. Amen. Great place to be. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, really uh, been a wonderful, uh, wonderful place and wonderful uh, fellowship, wonderful sermon. Amen. Amen. And then uh, everybody, hopefully they can make it out on Tuesday morning, everybody that can. And then uh, if not, we'll see you guys on Wednesday night. So make plans to be here and get the word out. Amen. Yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today with uh, thankful hearts. Lord, we thank you for the services we've had today. Lord, we thank you for everybody that's out here in the building. Thank you for everybody that's watching online, dear Lord. We just thank you again, Lord, just for the uh, the privilege to be in your house, dear Lord, and to get in your word and to learn and read. Thank you for the, the, the service that we had today, dear Lord. Thank you for the singing that we had, Father, and thank you for the, the sermon, dear Lord, on distractions. Pray that we would uh, not let spiritual distraction in our life, Lord, that we would keep our eyes on you, dear Lord. Help us to do that by, by getting in your word every day, Father, and just uh, continuing to grow and be the Christians that you want us to be. Father, and again, we thank you for the opportunity to be out here, get us all home safely, to bring us back again on uh, Tuesday morning for all those who can make it, and then on Wednesday night, hope to see everybody else back out. Lord, we thank you again for this opportunity. Nonetheless, we ask not our will, but your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, God. 